Welcome back to This is Live, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News Channel. With me today I have Professor David Awurawo, Professor of International Relations and Strategic Studies at the University of Lagos. I also have Yemi Adamolekun, Executive Director in Enough. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Yemi, uh, for joining me today. Well, very quickly, we have our two guests. Chikambonu talked about the appointment, the nomination of a new CBN governor. And then we had uh, Mr. Farin Loye, the Southwest Coordinator of the National Emergency Management Agency, talking about floods, global warming, the despair that ordinary people are facing, and the failure of local governments. And he was defending the federal government and the state uh, Governments. You both listen to him. Yemi, let me start with you. Well, I'll start with the second guest first. I think, I mean, in fairness to him, he works for disaster management and he works for a federal agency. But I think where he, he might have kind of gotten himself in a fix was then saying that government is working very well. Because when people say government, people mean the three tiers. Rarely would people separate and say, oh, I'm, I mean the local government, I mean the state government, I mean the federal government. So government is the three tiers. And so in speaking, he said the, there's political will and the government is working very well together. Until you then pushed and asked him about the local government. And that's when he started speaking. And then you speaking about government generally, he then got a bit defensive to say that, no, <clears throat> my agency is actually doing our work. Now, and I think in fairness to him, he can say the agency is doing their work. But as far as a Nigerian is concerned, it is government. So the fact that the local government is not functional, um, as functional as it should be, and, he, and in, in his statements as well, it got a bit confused. He was talking about the state government controlling the local government, which is the three separate tiers. Even though we know that the state government holds the resources of the local government, I think the fact that he admitted that inadvertently was actually quite funny to me. But the challenges between state and local government, the, the inability for the state or the federal government to cascade information down freely to the local government because it gets stuck at the state government. So anyway, in the process of saying the dynamics of the challenges that he has. He actually spoke very generally about the challenges with our three tiers of government. The state government has way too much influence on the local government than it should. And in that process, a lot is, a lot is lost. And now the second point that I think is important, he focused on deaths as a marker of performance. Now, if deaths is their KPI, and obviously the, if zero people die, that's great. One person different from 20 or 30, not any less meaningful. But so if you make death your KPI, as long as you have zero death, you'll think you're working. But we saw the footage while he was talking of people scooping water out of their homes. The phone that's damaged, the sofa that's damaged, the carpet that's damaged, the structure of a house that's damaged. <clears throat> whose account, <clears throat> excuse me, whose account, yeah, that footage, whose account is that written in? Yes, no one died, but people lost assets. And so part of this tying to disaster management, if the KPI is death, then I think maybe we need to talk a bit about that in terms of what is valued as, the, um, as a challenge of, of, of floods and things of that nature. And the second bit that he talked about um, in terms of global warming and we're doing the best that we can, flashpoints, da 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 to prevent disaster or risk reduction, as you said, I didn't hear him speak specifically about direct efforts to ensure prevention. And you made the point as well, urban planning. I mean, we know, at least I'll speak for Lagos very clearly, structures that are built on drainages, markets that are on drainages. In those things being there, we won't have to be doing disaster management if people obeyed the laws. Now, people don't obey the laws because there's no penalty, and that's government's role. So as a government agency, to reduce your work as well, it would be good to see that actually being part of what their KPI is. How do we get local governments to enforce the powers that they have to ensure that urban planning parameters are, are, are obeyed, so to speak? Now, on Mr. Cardozo, I think, I mean, the, Mr. Mbono spoke about the major issues. Commercial banker, challenges that monetary focus might be weak. But I think also quite importantly, really, is also what his relationship with the president brings. So as you quite rightly said, a lot of Lagos people with, with, uh, with the president. Now, if you're with people who you've known quite a bit and who know you, are you able to still assert your independence and say what you believe should be done, 
even if your principal disagrees with you. And if your principal disagrees with you and says, no, I'd, I'd rather we do this, and you know that it's not in the best interest of the country at that point in time, what do you do? And I think it will be an interesting dynamic to see how that plays out for Mr. Cardozo, Mr. Edun, who's in finance, um, FI, Mr. What's his name? Zach, no, Leg Adedeji. Lagos boys. Lagos uh, well, Southwest Adedeji boys. Is from a bad one. Lagos yeah. Southwest boys at FIRS or Revenue, whatever they call the ministry. It will be very interesting to see how that plays out. And I think more important, well, let me know more importantly, but the good thing I think we will see is that based on his pedigree, the CBN will stop dabbling in things that don't concern that Apex Bank. And Apex Bank's job is price stability. So when your CBN becomes a COVID headquarters, a Greek headquarters, health intervention headquarters, then kind of dissipating energy and focus. So at least based on his own background, we can be sure that he would focus the CBN where the CBN should be focused on. But it'll be interesting to see the dynamics with his principle. But mm. I wish him. I wish him mm. Okay, you are right. He's conservative. Yeah. He comes from a very strong pedigree. Yes. As I pointed out in that conversation, his father was uh, first accountant general of Nigeria in 1960. And here you have his son, uh, you know, many years later, emerging as a CBN mm -hmm. governor. And he, you know, his father went on to be MD of Barclays Bank. So there's something to be said about where people come okay, from. Indeed. You know, very apart from his own uh, credentials. Although, you know, people say he's just a commercial banker with a background in business management, mm -hmm. not necessarily an economist. And, and what I say to people is that, look, a journalist was once CBN uh, governor, governor, Adam Shiroma. Mm, you know, true, and uh, it wasn't problematic. Yeah, so even uh, Ruben Abachi could have been a CBN governor <laughs> and we would do a good job. But, but, but before you go on, <laughs> Professor Urawa, I also found out recently, apparently, that the CBN has the highest concentration of PhDs of any government institution. So I think at some point he estimated there might be 40 odd PhD, economic PhDs at the central bank. So the key is, I think, I mean, obviously the central bank governor is extremely powerful, but the key is, even if that's not his background, it's not to say that he does, he does not have access to those resources. Where it's what he, he does with the skill precise. set exactly. that is available exactly. to him and what he does exactly. with the Monetary Policy Committee, uh -huh. where they will need to get people who understands basic economics. Professor Awurawo. Yeah, um, I will begin with the CBN uh, governor and the economy generally. Um, I think Mr. Cardoso would do well. He was commissioner for budget and economic plan in Lagos uh, under Tinubu when, uh, you know, Ashwaji Tinubu was uh, governor, uh, 1997. And, uh, you know, he, he did well. He did, he did quite well as a uh, uh, commissioner for budget and economic planning at that time. Uh, it was in Citibank, top, very top level. Uh, so, uh, I mean, he has everything that is required to be able to, you know, function well. Mm. And I'm confident he will do well. Um, don't forget, Mifile too was a commercial banker. You know, he was in Citibank. Yeah, you bank, you uh, want so. to compare them. That's not a good sign. No, 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 no. I, I'm Rao, saying that. <laughs> no, what I'm saying that, uh, you know, uh, the, the, you know the, the, the fact that he has been in the commercial bank does not mean that uh, he doesn't have everything that... Let me feel it was a disaster. So what's it, the comparison? It, 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 yes, I'm okay, saying so what's that. what's the comparison? He, being from the... And people from that background mm -hmm. have headed, you know, uh, uh, okay. CBM before. And of course, like uh, Dr. Oh, Fatia don't said, worry. <laughs> he was was one CBM yes. yes. no, he, 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 so, he was trying to use a Mayfield as a yardstick so of a commercial now, bank. After five years, years of that, get the point out. Don't be surprised. No, get the point I want to make. He shows up as now, CBM governor. No, get the, the, get the point I want to make. The point I want to make is this. Are you are you decamping to APC? No, the point I want to make is this. I don't have to be in APC. There are qualities that you need to be able to succeed on this job. He needs courage. He needs to be able to tell the president things frankly, not minding, you know, what their relationship is. He needs to be cerebral. It's obviously he no, is cerebral. He is. Yeah. Emifile is not. He's well educated. Of course, all Emifile's policies no, just that was not. No, don't say that. Right. Emifile used to be a, a teacher in a school. So he, so does that no, make that him that cerebral? Right no, 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 no. No, he, he, no, he has a solid academic background. Well, well, no, please. Then third, um, synergy. You know, the last uh, group. Apparently, couldn't work together. They, they couldn't really mix well. Of, when the currency, you know, for instance, when the currency thing swap was to be carried out, the minister said she was not aware. Uh, the civilian governor said she didn't have to be aware. The law says 
they could go, you know, they didn't quite function properly. I imagine that Cardoso and Edun will work in synergy. And like Yemi has said, I also expect that Cardoso will focus on monetary policy and forget about all this farm, all these other things that CBN is not supposed to be, you know, uh, 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 bothered about that the CBN has been engrossed. And it should also issue politics. It should work as a professional. I'm sure it will do all of this, and I'm sure it will work. But two things I also want to comment on this very quickly. People have been saying that, just like people in the, in the Northwest or in the North, in the core North, dominated everywhere. When President Buhari was there, it would seem that President Tinubu is replicating the same thing. That the Southwesterners and the CBN governor, uh, uh, FRS, Finance, uh, FRS, CBN, you know, virtually everything, chief of army, you know. So um, we should, it should not be dismissed. President Ashwaji should be you know, uh, sensitive it's a, to that. It's a bit late. So that, it? No, it's not late. There are still many appointments to make. Uh, so many appointments to make. These ones are key, and probably one can pardon the president. He wants success, and he wants to identify people who have been successful before, who have worked with him, that he thinks will do the job. Did moving we, forward. Did we pardon Buhari? Yeah. That he wanted success uh, and well, he wanted people he Moving knew. forward, yes, that's the difference now. Moving forward, <laughs> President Buhari, President Tinubu should listen to people's, he should not dismiss people's comments on this and ensure that appointments that will be made moving forward should spread as much as possible. Inclusiveness we talk about will then be there. Uh, popular participation will be there. Everybody will have a sense of belonging. It is very key. It should not be dismissed as just um, the comments of noisemakers. But do you think he cares? It's not comments of noisemakers. But do you think he cares? He should care. No, but my question was, do you think he cares? Uh, well, I'm not sure, but he should care. That's why I'm saying what I'm saying. So these are the things that need. And of course, the last point, we are not sure whether uh, 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 Mishwili has resigned. They say he has resigned. If he has resigned, fantastic. But nobody is sure. It's still a matter of conjecture as to whether he has resigned or not. That needs to be cleared so that there is no contradiction, there is no problem you know, regarding uh, has the right thing been done? What does the law yeah, say? Yeah, that's another that. thing about just yes. unnecessary drama. I mean, just the statement announcing Yemi Kadozo could have had one sentence saying that um, Yemi Fili had resigned. Yes. And then we won't be spending time. Yes. And then Even, Reuters, yeah, I mean, yeah. The Mbilari, you know, that's the spokesman. Yeah. When he was asked, he, he didn't make any comment. Exactly. So he, he has left things for speculation. That needs to be cleared. Then climate change is crucial, it's important. When we have a problem like this, my take is that we should have an immediate, you know, short term, medium term, and long term. Short term, Lagos needs more drainages. You know, um, people need to be prevented from building where they should not, and not only Lagos, everywhere across the country. Those are the immediate things that will need to be done. Dams may need to be built, more dams may need to be built so that waters can be collected and released accordingly, and then reduce the you know, the problem of flooding and all. See the one in uh, Libya, for instance, two dams collapsed. Yes. There was no synergy between the people who were in charge of metrology and those who were manning the dams. And then the dams burst practically and collapsed. 11,000 dead, it is a catastrophe. No, over 30,000. Oh, okay, well, I saw 11,300. Over 30,000 dead. Um, over 10, 10, another 10,000 missing. Over 10,000 uh, missing. That is a disaster of immense proportion. So these are the things we need us. Of course, the medium term. Of course, the long term, climate change is a major issue. All con countries are, you know, trying to see what they can do to contribute their quota to reducing greenhouse uh, uh, gas emissions. Yes. We should not say because other people polluted before and then uh, mm -hmm. we didn't contribute much to it and be unconcerned. No. We should work with the rest of the world to ensure that greenhouse gases are reduced. Since scientifically it has been identified as a major source of the climate change that, you know, we have. Countries like Holland, for instance, they have a, I mean, they made a law, they have a law in 2019, say, okay, by 2030, we'll reduce greenhouse gases by 49%. By 2050, we'll come to almost zero. You know, we should have something like that. We should have a, 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 a clear cut, uh, you know, yes. And then uh, processes of ensuring that those things are carried out, such that, you know, short term, medium term, long term, we can deal with these, uh, you know, environmental disasters we are having. Flooding being the central one in the last uh, couple of weeks or so. Mm. Well said, but quickly, let's look at another story of interest in the course of the week. The United Arab Emirates has debunked claims by the Nigerian government that it is to lift a year-long visa ban on Nigerian travelers. An official from the Gulf State to CNN, and I quote: "There are no changes." 
on the Nigeria-UAE travel status so far. The source asked not to be named because he was not authorized to speak to the media. The United Arab Emirates said in a notice last October, it will no longer issue visas to citizens from Nigeria and 19 other African nations. It did not provide further details. Obtaining a 30-day tourist visa was relatively easy until the UAE abruptly stopped using visas to Nigerian nationals. Flights between both countries were stopped last year after Dubai's Emirates Airlines suspended its operations in Nigeria, citing trapped revenues. The carrier said it could not assess and repatriate its funds amounting to $85 million without in Nigeria. Now, that's the story. Then you also recall that in the course of the week, this was a big issue. Uh, President Tinubu visiting the UAE on his way from the uh, G20 uh, summit in New Delhi, India, and that stopover, the major outcome, one, two of the five outcomes uh, that we have seen released by the uh, presidency is that one, you know, visas will now be provided to Nigerians. Two, Emirates Airlines and uh, Etihad will resume their flights to Nigeria. And now CNN, throwing a curveball, through an interview with an uh, Emirati of official saying, well, it's not true. And many Nigerians have pointed out that in the uh, uh, readout, the press release by the uh, United Arab Emirates, there was no reference mm -hmm. to the fact that Nigeria, you know, can now have free uh, can now have visas or that Emirates Airlines will, be, uh, will return. And in any case, we were told after the president returned, oh, that there were discussions between Nigerian officials and Emirati officials. So what's happening here? Is the Nigerian government deceiving the people? And really, how can two countries mm -hmm. having different. a bilateral meeting be offering us two different, different versions summaries. of the same event, same story, same meeting? Professor Awurao, let's start with you this time. Um, I, I, I think, um, like you have just said, I've also read you know, the release. There is nothing specifically indicating that you know, um, the ban has been lifted, visas will not be granted and all that. There's nothing like that. So I think the delegation, the Nigerian delegation, there was overexcitement. Uh, there is also this uh, tendency to want to say we're achieving. Mm -hmm. We have achieved so much and all that. Uh, you know, uh, presumptuousness, overzealousness. Because when you look at really this thing, there is nothing that specifically states that. The Equisile have said, the meeting was fruitful, which was, which was actually what we saw. The atmosphere was convivial. And that we are confident that very soon, all of these issues will be trashed out. And then Nigeria, I mean, the visa ban and all that will be lifted. That would have been you know, a more mature approach to it. So it's, it seems to me that it is the Nigerian side that you know, hasn't presented um, the, the, what transpired as factually as they should. Because we've read through you know, what they released. And there is nothing that indicates specifically that the ban has been lifted and all that. So it's not so much a case of uh, contradiction. It's a case of uh, the, a you know, our own side, you know, going beyond what was, you know, uh, uh, agreed. Because especially yeah. because ours says the um, visa restriction has been lifted with immediate effect or something to that effect. Yes. That is, and so that's a contradiction yes. from someone who doesn't even talk about it at all. So even if you had talked about it and they said we will look at it and we'll talk about it. I mean, and then this is where I think maturity comes into it. I think the spokesperson was just being a bit too, to your point, too eager to share and didn't think through what it means. And so the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs was on a rise on Friday and he said the visa status and bilateral agreements between the two countries are still a work in progress. I mean, mm -hmm. you have a meeting with two heads of states. Is it then that suddenly visas will be, I mean, nobody... It doesn't function that way. The fact that they even issued the statement just shows a certain level of, I don't even know, just, there's an, there's an English word I'm looking for, but because English is not my first language, it's not coming to me. But anyway, the, <laughs> it's just a certain level of just, I don't, anyway, but yeah. So okay. it's quite unfortunate. I mean, some of the travel agents, for example, started- um, They were excited. Uh, they, yeah. um, adverts. And I'm like, people, uh, yeah. this mm. thing is not like Yeah, they, those who made the release like didn't uh, behave maturely. They and not, not moving to... forward, this, this needs to be corrected. Okay, let's take one more topic, you know, and see what, we, what else we can do. 
No fewer than 35 lecturers across Nigeria's tertiary institutions have been indicted and dismissed over sexual misconduct in the past five years. Professor Awarao, you are a professor. You teach. <laughs> so this subject is about... Leave Professor Awarao. <laughs> <laughs> sexual harassment has been recurring in Nigerian higher institutions of learning with a survey conducted in 2018 by the World Bank Group's Women revealing that 70% of female graduates from tertiary institutions in the country were sexually harassed in school, with the main perpetrators being classmates and lecturers. Although the Nigerian Senate had in 2021 passed a bill 